Well, today is our, uh, we're in the middle of uh, a good run on staying positive, and uh, I pray it's, it's uh, helping all of us in that process. Um, it, it is a process to, to stay positive. It's something that uh, we got to have our focus in the right place. We took a look at, you know, all the reasons we have to be positive in this world no matter what's going on, and it has to do with Jesus Christ and what he's done for us, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Uh, there, there's lots of other reasons. We know we have uh, God on our side in, in every matter. He's on our side uh, not only in, in terms of his word and his strength, but he's on our side. Uh, Jesus is there interceding for us. The Holy Spirit takes our feeble prayers, our cries for help, he, he transforms them into powerful petitions before the throne of God, uh, the, the one that is almighty, all-powerful in every way. And he, he's there to help us stay positive in, in the many needs of this world, as Pastor Chera pointed out last week. And in terms of uh, we have the opportunity to stay positive. Uh, as we're generous in, in helping people in a lot of ways. One of the things that's often said that uh, struck me as is not really helpful, and, and that's when we start comparing the two different kinds of people. Uh, like the two different kinds of people in regard to being positive or negative. The glass half full, the glass half empty. Uh, and that struck me the greatest when I was looking at this this reason for staying positive is enthusiasm. And uh, it was stated that there's two different kinds of people. Uh, those that, are, uh, that let their environment uh, dictate their enthusiasm versus those who uh, their enthusiasm is what helps their environment to be what it is. And then you're supposed to say, what, which one of those are you? That's not real comforting for me personally because I find myself at times being very enthusiastic and other times being uh, rather discouraged. And as we talked about, being weary and uh, having, having difficulty, especially in certain situations. And so I can find myself as probably all of us can, at one time or another, being enthusiastic about something or being more apathetic. And that, to me, is, sets us up for good news because that's why we're doing what we're doing with this series, uh, learning how God helps us to stay positive even when <laughs> it's difficult. And, and so today uh, is, is no different in that as well. And, and so today's more about uh, a, a spiritual enthusiasm versus a mood swings. And uh, I talked about being encouraged and having people in my life that encouraged me. One that came to mind this week in terms of enthusiasm uh, was a man named Einar Mohn. Uh, his name still is Einar Mohn. He's just now been transported to heaven. Uh, Iron, uh, Einer went from the depths of hell in regard to his life on earth to now the highest heights of heaven in the throne room of God. And when I say that, the depths of hell on earth, Einer, uh, I met when he was a little, in, in his early 80s in Redwood City, California, and I was just, I was just starting out as a DCE intern. He, he ran the uh, senior ministry out there. Einer didn't have any family uh, around him to speak of uh, that he was close to at all. He, um, he lived alone, but he was very dedicated uh, and, and worked hard, and he, was, and he was always enthusiastic about the work of the Lord, no matter what was going on. We went through some difficult times at our church, and Einer was just a rock. He kind of took me under his wing uh, during that time, and uh, and knew how raw I was and how easily discouraged I could be. And uh, I, I come to learn where Einer's 
enthusiasm came from, and it came from uh, the depths from which he had been brought. You see, Einer was the uh, Einer was the head of the Teamsters Union in the we uh, western third of the United States. And he answered directly to Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, the only time I saw Einer struggle was when he, you could tell he was thinking about that past. And he could never say anything. And he'd say, I would put you in grave danger to tell you anything. But his tears always showed me how it hurt to look back at that life under one of the most notorious gangsters in, in our country's history. He's the only one in three levels of leadership in that uh, regime that lived to an old age and died of old age. And Einer was so thankful for being delivered from that depth that he couldn't see life any other way and the kingdom of God and the work of God's kingdom in any other way than enthusiastic because he saw what God had done for him continuously and it was great to be encouraged to to see that and I think we need to be reminded of that and I put two Greek words on your outline today uh, I thought it's time to learn some Greek. We're going to get really into this. These are very simple words in the Greek, but they're really the root of where we get the word enthusiasm, and it's entheos. And uh, you can almost guess what the words actually mean, but it means in God. Theos, the uh, theology is where we get our word of study of God. Enthusiasm is the word that comes from the, the excitement, the, the motivation, the, uh, the being lifted up, the strengthening of being in God, or another way to translate it is God in us. And that's what we have through the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, as we look at this, I want to uh, check in on 1 Corinthians 15. Um, this is a powerful passage that uh, talks about uh, something we have. It starts out, well, before we start on this, I want to just back up a little bit. Uh, it says right before this passage on the screen, death has been swallowed up in victory. Okay, That's powerful. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Then it says, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, we, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are we enthusiastic about that? Amen? Yes, we are. This is the most important thing for all of us in life today, no matter what we're facing. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. By the way, there's a neat translation in the New Living Translation says, be enthusiastic in the work of the Lord. There's another passage that I want you to look at here. It's Colossians 3.23. And it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for man. So many times, what we do, we tend to do for man. We tend to do for ourselves, this man or woman, we do it for the people we're doing it for, and we don't get the thanks we think we deserve. We're discouraged. When we do it for the wrong people, for the wrong reasons, it's easy to not be so enthusiastic. And yet, if we're doing it in response to what God has already done for us, 
it's easy to be enthusiastic because we have it all. We have all the riches. We have all the power. We have an eternity sewed up. We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever, I want you to notice that word, whatever. Whether we're changing diapers, as Luther liked to say. We do it for the Lord. Whether we're a CEO of a company, whether, uh, whether we're cleaning bathrooms, whether we're uh, being nurses or doctors or uh, we're selling insurance or we're tilling the soil or whatever it is we're doing, it's, it's all to the glory of the Lord when we keep in mind our enthusiasm is not a mood swing. It comes from what we have and can be sure of in Jesus Christ. And so today, I want to look at a great example of entheos, of David, of King David. The in God, or the God in David. And I think uh, it's, it's a great example, especially uh, as we turn and we look at uh, his enthusiasm. Uh, in First. Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. This is a, a, a powerful text, of course, when David was going out uh, to meet Goliath, and he wasn't all that old. And I want you to hear the enthusiasm in what David had to say. David said to the Philistine, this Goliath, he said, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And I want to add this verse too, verse 47. It says, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into my hand. Is he enthusiastic? Now, in a bit of a morbid way. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's some pretty graphic stuff, but man... He is certain and sure and enthusiastic about what God is going to do that day. He's not really looking at what he's going to do. He's looking at what God's going to do. And he trusts that. And he trusts that. That's, that brings me to the three things I want to point out about why is David so enthusiastic? And the first one is, is that he trusts God. David trusted God. Why? Why did he have any reason to trust God? Well, we learn from his backstory that he was a shepherd boy. Couldn't have been very big or very strong. We learned that from when he got called to be king. Uh, they didn't even want to parade him out there because he wasn't all that. Right? Don't you have another son, Jesse? Oh, yeah, the runt out there watching the sheep. Well, bring him out. But what he learned while he was a shepherd was to trust in God. Why? Because when a lion came against him and his flock, God delivered that lion into his hands. When the bear came to take him and his flock, God delivered that bear into his hands. It was in the, the working out of life that can be very uh, violent, very ugly, sometimes very difficult, that we learn to trust God. But the greatest way he has shown us that he can be trusted is that he has given us our life. God has delivered into our hands the worst enemies we could ever imagine. First of all, our sin. He delivered every one of our sins onto the cross where they were paid for, and he gave us total freedom from every sin. He did that for the whole world, by the way. 
God delivered death into our hands. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? We have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has delivered into our hands the devil himself. The devil is no more than a rabid, uh, insane animal on a leash. And he can't come against us because he has been defeated. He's still looking. He's still trying to be deceitful. He's still trying to work his way, but he can't go outside the bounds that God has set for him. Secondly, he walked with God. David came to a place in his life where he uh, wrote a psalm, and it's, it's a very dear psalm, and uh, it, it's the 23rd psalm. Right? Do we know it? <laughs> what, what does he do? I, I, I'm at want for nothing. Why? Because he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He leads me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he was with me, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He had an intimate walk with the Lord. He walked with God, and it's implied that he did that Daily, And by the way, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death every day. As long as we're in this body, in this world. Because as soon as Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, death came into the world. And death is where we're going. But it's been defeated. We have the victory. And like David, even though we walk through that valley of the shadow of death daily... He is with us to deal with whatever is before us enthusiastically. And that's what we see David worshipped God, the third thing. Uh, if you remember when he had the ark brought up into uh, the city of David, he was so excited. Remember? He danced. I've been so tempted sometimes to just put a robe on and dance up here sometimes. <laughs> My wife would be as embarrassed as his wife was, I'm sure. And he didn't do it just for show. He did it because he was enthusiastic. He did it because he couldn't contain his joy and enthusiasm for worshiping the Lord. It was unbound enthusiasm. And we have those times. We have those times when, uh, well, I know some of you, uh, root for certain football teams and I can imagine what you look like. But David was that Old Test or that, that uh, guy that in the Old Testament that uh, you see at games that's painted he doesn't have a shirt on and it's like 10 below zero and he's painted from here up. We'll probably see some on the course there in a dome but I'm just saying you know the enthusiasm that David showed uh, isn't a real Lutheran thing, but it's okay, <laughs> right? We can be enthusiastic. And we have those times when we read the Word of God and it speaks to us, doesn't it? And, and we've had those mountaintops experiences when we've worshipped the Lord in a setting or something and, and we feel His presence in an incredible way. And we've had those times when we've prayed and he's answered our prayers. And we've used our gifts to help somebody or to serve someone. And it's given us such great joy and enthusiasm. We've had those times where he's been so great in our life that we just want to stay in that presence for as long as we possibly can. And then we go back 
to the real life. We go back to other seasons in our life, like David did. And I want to look at the two seasons of David's life. The first one uh, that we want to look at here, 1 Samuel uh, verse 48, it's the very next verse that we've been looking at here. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David, what did he do? He ran quickly. He charging head on into it. He couldn't wait to get into it. And what did he do? He ran to him, ran to the battle line to meet him. Wow. Now I want you to see uh, another, just, just a, we go to 2 Samuel for this. Fast forward. In the spring, David sent Joab with the king's men, and the whole Israelite army. But David remained in Jerusalem. Then see what it says. One evening, David got up from his bed, and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. See the two seasons of David here? One is he's running... And I have those points on your outline here. With enthusiasm, David ran into the battle to serve his God. And yet, sometime later, now he's a king, he's comfortable, and we see him not running, not being where he's supposed to be when all the kings are out with their armies, but he stayed home. So we see a comfortable king in apathy walking and going nowhere, and looking around, seeing things he shouldn't be seeing, desiring things he shouldn't be desiring, sending for things he shouldn't be having. Why? Because he's apathetic. Why did David lose his enthusiasm? And the whole reason has to do with he took his eyes off his call, And he put him on his comfort. David took his eyes off his calling as a child of God and he put him on his comfort. That's so easy for all of us to do. It's easy for your pastor to do. It's easy for you to do. It's easy for us as a congregation to do, to take our eyes off our calling and to put it on our comfort. If we find ourselves coming to church and going home griping more than we're going home praising, maybe we've taken our eyes off our calling and we put it on our comfort. King David was uh, confronted I uh, was getting ready for our Bible study this morning in Revelation, and uh, this passage was one that I read. I thought it was pretty, pretty powerful. In Revelation chapter two, it's uh, he's addressing the church in uh, Ephesus, and he says, "Yet I hold against you, you have forsaken your first love. Remember the height." from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove the lampstand from its place. Remember the height from which you've fallen. David had fallen a great distance. It brings me back to Einer at the beginning of our time together today. I I mentioned Einer He always remembered the depth from which he came and was raised up. And that's what helped him to stay on the heights. David forgot the height from which he had fallen. And Nathan came to him and he told him a story and convicted David. And David responded with these words that he wrote. Another psalm, Psalm 51. 
And he said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He goes on to say, restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. It's never too late. Yes, like David, we are people that can be enthusiastic or not. But God always gives us the power as we repent and we turn to him to be able to do what he has called us to do. To focus enthusiastically on the mission he's given us to carry out right here in this place and among these people. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for showing us, even in someone like David, a man after your own heart, how easy it is to fall. How easy it is to grow weary and tired and, and lose our focus and, and focus on the wrong things in life. Lord, we do turn to you like David and we say, renew in us a new spirit. Help us to have the joy of your salvation, the salvation you have given to us, to realize that our enemies have all been defeated, delivered into our hands. And from that, may we go out enthusiastic for all that needs to happen in this world for your name's sake. Amen.